Chapter 17, Hobo Marks. The revelation that the Midnight Sun had financed the mummy exhibit certainly added an interesting wrinkle to the curious case of the walking mummy. It meant that the Midnight Sun knew who Dr. Noom was and that they wanted the mummy nearby. That much was clear. What confounded Max Ernest as he walked home that afternoon was the question of whether or not they were now in possession of the mummy. He saw three possibilities. One, the Midnight Sun had broken into the museum and taken the mummy. If so, why were they not on the video? Two, and he was hesitant to believe this, the Midnight Sun had somehow managed to resurrect the mummy. The mummy had then left the museum according to their instructions and was now their zombie slave. Three, equally unlikely, their plan had backfired. The mummy had come back to life, whether with the Midnight Sun's help or on his own, and had when he walked out on his own accord. In that case, the mummy was now roaming the world as a rogue agent. Max Ernest didn't accept any of these possibilities, but no matter how much he thought about it, he could not think of any others. Thinking, as you probably know from experience, can be very hazardous to your health. I don't mean that thinking may lead you to do something hazardous, like investigate secrets, although of course that's true as well. I mean thinking can cause you physical harm. But of the best days, Max Ernest was prone to walking into things, walls, cars, telephone poles, fire hydrants, people carrying trays of food or bags of groceries. When he was deep in thought, as he was now, he was liable to walk off a cliff. Luckily, the drop t from the curb to the street was only a few inches. Still, it was sufficient to cause him to trip and fall, and I sprawled on the asphalt, conscientious anxiously about the, all the possible strains and abstractions of breaks and bruises he might have not just now or in the future to be suffering from. The view from the ground level is seldom pleasant unless you happen to be lying in a meadow or on a sandy beach, but it can be revelatory. Sometimes when we are at our lowest point we make our greatest discoveries. Not so Max Ernest. Eyes bl blurred, cheeks scraped, Max Ernest stared across the street to the empty lot on the other side. He waited for some profound realization. It didn't come. Thankfully, neither did any cars. He didn't did how he did, however, see something that would cause his pulse to quicken. A movement in the bushes. And what was that? An arm? A leg? Then nothing. Max Ernest's first instinct was to stay where he was and play dead. Then he realized that it was silly. There was someone a reanimated mummy, for example, or more likely his reanimated schoolmate, Amber, who wanted to attack him. He would be far more vulnerable lying in the street than standing up. And even if nobody meant him any harm, there was still the possibility of being run over. Reluctantly, he stood. Imagining that Cass was watching and judging his actions, he resisted running home and instead walked across the street to investigate. Hello? The words came out as a screech. Nobody answered. There was no sound of any kind, until a pigeon flew out from behind the bush. Max Ernest looked around, feeling rather foolish. His mother's house, or more accurately, his mother's half-house, had stood there in this lot during the time it was separated from his father's half-house. Max Ernest remembered a t the time well. A hopeful time when it seemed for once in his parents slept might live like a normal divorced parents. That is, separately. Now that his mother's half-house had rejoined his father's and his parents were once again cohabitating and once again not speaking to each other, all that remained of this place of his mother's half-house were a half-dozen or so slabs of cement and a variety of sad-looking weeds. Usually nothing decorated the surface of the cement except for dead leaves and the occasional splattering of bird droppings. Today, however, he saw something more intriguing. He looked around to make sure he was unobserved. He leaned down to inspect the cement more closely. Yes, there, there it was. The faint but unmistakable two symbols drawn in chalk. Hieroglyphs. Could it be a message left to him by the mummy? In real time, and not dreamed? He looked again. No, this wasn't a message from the mummy. Still, the markings looked very similar to hieroglyphs, and in general sense, they were hieroglyphs. Not ancient Egypt hieroglyphs, but my modern ones. They were hobo marks. 
A written code used by hobos to communicate secretly with one another, oftentimes offering warnings and advice. To most people, these marks as mess or a sweet would mean nothing, even to a hobo. They would appear cautionary, if not downright crazy. Literally translated, the two symbols meant, go quickly, flee today, safe place to spend night. To members of the Trace Society, however, they meant something quite different, urgent. Meet tonight at headquarters. Max Ernst walked home with a furrowed brow. Why was Pietro calling in the troops? They'd been sending him regular reports on the mummy situation, but maybe he wanted to hear about it in person. Or perhaps Pietro had some information for them. In either case, Max Ernest welcomed the chance to talk to the old magician. No doubt he would provide new insight on the curious case of the walking mummy. Shortly before midnight, Max Ernest stood across the street from Cass's house, anxiously checking his watch. Pietro was the kind of man whose favorite form of relaxation consisted of fixing old clocks so they kept perfect time. He didn't like it when people were late. Max Ernest felt a tap on his shoulder. Flinching, he turned around, all the way around, until he saw Cass smiling mischievously at him. Just a little taste of your own medicine. I hope I didn't scare you too much. Only because you're late, he replied irritably. Three minutes and 42 seconds later than last time. You should practice climbing out your bedroom window more often. And you should stop looking at your watch. I've been standing right behind you for longer than that. Really? No, but I might have been. You should be more careful. He opened his mouth, trying to think of a snappy comeback when Yoji walked up. Hey, he said. Hey, said his friends. Sorry about the library today, said Yoji. I know that it was kind of goofy. Miss Johnson made me go with Amber and then... What are you sorry for? People like who they like, said Cass. I don't like her. When I saw her bag, I decided to be nice to find out what she if she knew anything. Whatever you say. Why do you have to be like that dude? Like what dude? Um, guys, Max Ernest trying to f and failing to get their attention. Just thinking you should be careful, said Cass. I mean, it's kind of dangerous hanging out with... Somebody who is in the midnight sun, you don't, don't you think? I wasn't hanging out with her, said Yoji, clenching his fists in frustration. My stars tried again. Guys, can you stop talking for a second? Cass and Yoji looked at him in surprise. The idea of Max and of all people and telling anybody to stop talking was a bit funny, to say the least. We're late, he said. I know, stop dawdling, said Cass. A little smile crossing her lips, and she just started walking. Come on, it's about 35 minutes to get there last time. 36, Mess, Ernest corrected. Yoji furrowed, scowling. Bogus, he mustered. So bogus, it's re bogus -less. Although officially an old-fashioned traveling circus, Pietro Circus hadn't traveled so much as an inch in the past year. A half dozen or so tents and equal number of trailers had made up the circus sat on a big dirt lot, and by now it had come to seem as permanent. It's not always pleasant home to be a circus folk. A lot was surrounded on all sides by old wire fence. There was only one way in the dirt road crossed by a rustling chain. Usually the chain wasn't in any real hindrance to passage. You simply walked over it or unhooked it from the post as you were driving your car or catering something or car carting something heavy. Tonight there was an additional obstacle blocking the way. Who's that? whispered Cass. A man, or a shadow of a man, stood stiffly in front of the chain. His arms and legs were spread, signaling that they were not to cross his face. They couldn't see. He didn't move as they came closer. He could have been a scarecrow. It didn't necessarily look like the mummy. Then again, in the video, they hadn't been able to see the mummy's face either. Chill, said Yoji, even if there's some mummy walking out there who wants to kill us for taking his finger. How would he know where we were coming here? Yoji's yeah, right, Maxner said. That won't make any sense. Well, let's keep going then, said Cass. She didn't say what she was thinking, that the, ring, that the ring hanging from her neck might be acting as some kind of homing device attracting the mummy. They had no choice but to walk right up to him. The man was wearing an old rumpled suit and a set stained fishing hat with a broken pigeon feather sticking out of it. His face was smudged in dirt and grease. He might not have been the mummy, but he looked very much as though he might be dug out of the ground. Not a reassuring sight by any means. 
Yo, what's up? Said Yoji nonchalantly. He kept walking as if he was every intention of stepping over the chain and entering the circus. Not so fast, Buster, said the man in a low rumble. His arms shot out in front of Yoji. Password? Password? We come here all the time, said Max and was trying not to sound nervous. We're friends of Pietro. I don't care if you're friends with the Queen of England. Nobody enters without the password. But nobody told us the password, said Cass. We didn't even get a hint. Okay, okay. If you would shut your b booze and stop bartering for a second, I'd give you punks a hint, the, said the man, softening. What a bronic is to a cowboy, a train is to a blank. That's easy, Max Ernst said. A cowboy rides a horse, and a conductor rides a train. That's true, but that's not the password. The password is four letters long. Well, how about pass, then? Said Cass, as short for passenger riding on a train, but also could be password. And why don't you let us pass now? This is crazy. Clever, said the man, not moving, but no, go. Wait, I know this, said Yoji. Unexpectedly, hobo. Max Harris blurted out, saying that the word at the same time as Yoji. Yoji gave him a look. Sorry, said Max Harris, I just figured it out. And, and you had about, had your say. To say it, I know. And you had to say it, I know. Said Yoji, no worries. You guys got it, hobo, that is. This disheveled crossing guard, just like me. A hobo help held up his arms and turned in circles to show off his outfit. You like the suit? I dressed up in case nobody saw me leaving those chalk marks today. Owen, cried Cass. The very same. He was an actor turned trace society spy. Grinning, he took off his fishing hat and bowed. At your service, my lady. I'm going to kill you, said Cass. Although she had great affection for Owen, it infuriated Cass that he always pretended to be somebody he wasn't, even when it wasn't strictly necessary. You know who we are, and it's not like we're in disguises, said Max Ernest. Why couldn't you just let us in? What fun would that be? Besides, I'm trying to delay going into the meeting, said Owen. He gr his grin faded. Why? What is this meeting about? asked Yoji can't be any worse than what we've been dealing with. Let's just say we have an unfriendly guest. Alarmed, the kids looked at one another. Could the mummy somehow have found his way to the circus after all? From somewhere in the darkness came the betraying the circus animals the sounds of tents flapping in the wind. 